This week, we've been reporting on poisons seeping into the soil from corroding oil tanks buried in homeowners' yards. But that's not the half of it. Tonight, the final installment of our three-part investigation into a danger beneath the soil. Brenda Flanagan joins us now. Brenda? Well, Mary Alice, New Jersey has a well-known toxic legacy that's born of its industrial past. What's less obvious are the thousands of smaller sites, like old gas stations, that are also listed on the state DEP's roster of contaminated areas lurking underground. We're investigating toxic New Jersey. Stand downwind and you can smell gasoline vapors rising from this sludge as it cascades out of the backhoe bucket. Workers just pull three 6,000 gallon tanks from this former Valero station in Warren County and now they're testing what lies beneath for chemical contaminants. It got added to the DEP's list of toxic sites this October. You can't miss this, but suppose you just see bare concrete or a grassy lot where decades-old service stations closed. You can't see the toxic cancer-causing chemicals in the ground soil. This mom of four can only remember. It was a gas station there. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, it was a gas station. She didn't want to show her face. She lives in a Trenton apartment house near a canal. It's a spot listed on the DEP's roster of contaminated underground tank sites. She didn't realize petrochemical vapors could penetrate her basement walls. Workers did some digging here about a year ago, and she claims tenants in her apartment complex got a disturbing form letter. We got a letter saying that there was some type of gas station that had some kind of contaminated soil. If you had any, like, symptoms of some type of illness to contact the health department. I mean, I'm, I'm outraged. Underground storage tanks, you know, are uh, an environmental ticking time bomb. Clean water advocate Doug O'Malley says it's treating families like pollution detectors. The canary and the coal mine are our families here in Trenton. That's not the way to do environmental policy in the state. Is there a problem? If you get sick, call us. That's, that's not how we should be treating the public here in New Jersey. Remedies don't always require all the contamination to be removed. The DEP says regulations permit tainted soil to remain at some commercial cleanup sites, but constant monitoring, often at test wells like these, is crucial for that system to work while waiting for toxins to break down. Because a contaminated site isn't a risk unless you have contamination present and you also have an exposure pathway. So by cutting off the exposure pathway, you've really successfully remediated the site. Last year, New Jersey's DEP logged about 5,000 cleanups at underground storage tank sites, but it discovered and added about 5,000 new sites to the list, which now totals about 14,000. Of those, about 10,000 are assigned for cleanup to private engineers called LSRPs, licensed site remediation professionals. LSRPs say it's unassigned sites and others waiting to be discovered that worry them. Because you have sites out there that could potentially be uh, dangerous that aren't being addressed and a lot of them where no one knows who the owner is or they kind of disappeared this the company went bankrupt um, that's probably the biggest challenge getting those sites and that that's something that the DEP is working on but even at assigned sites, enforcement's the larger problem. At an old Getty station in Kloster, the gasoline tanks got yanked in 1998, but on-site wells show soil contaminated with toluene and other chemicals still lies beneath the cracked asphalt. Kloster Environmental Commissioner Paul McDonald says nobody's ever tested the groundwater further downhill. Well, there's definitely contamination. I'm not aware if the contamination has moved off site. That's critical because the defunct station's across the road from a working farm and about 450 yards from the Oradell Reservoir, a primary drinking water source for more than a million New Jersey residents. United Water Company says it's detected no contamination. Davies Enterprises bought the problematic site in 2009. The owners had the property for quite a while. I'm surprised uh, it's been sitting like this for this amount of time. DEP records originally showed Davies was a year and a half behind on their cleanup schedule. In fact, the DEP reports some 20 percent of sites like these are non-compliant. A federal EPA survey showed recalcitrant responsible parties accounted for about a third of New Jersey's remediation backlog in 2011. And we've been working with municipalities as a pilot to put in a, a, a uh, ticket initiative. We've taken some initiatives through the municipal courts, and we've, it's worked out very well. So the people who miss deadlines, though, who haven't, for example, gotten 
banged by a ticket yet. Um, we'll get to them. But the DEP didn't ticket Davies. It blamed a paperwork error. Its records for the Trenton site were 18 months outdated. Critics say the department's too understaffed and overwhelmed to enforce its own regulations. This fall, Closter did ticket Davies, but only for failing to maintain the dilapidated building. They must have known there was a pollution problem in the soil underground. And uh, when they bought it, they assumed the liability. The Closter site's LSRP, Keith Gagnon, claims tests show the contamination gradually abates with time and that they have new plans to drill extra monitoring wells across the road and nearer the reservoir next spring. Sunoco owns the Trenton site, which hugs the Delaware Raritan Canal and says it's also constantly monitoring test wells, waiting for contaminants to weather out of the soils. It could take years. We should clean up the problem and clean up the pollution and not just hope that someone doesn't get sick. Mom's lived here five years and both of her young sons are chronically ill. I don't know, I'm just something that I'm gonna bring up to the um, pediatrician when I take them. Makes you wonder. That mom, like so many people living around these sites, didn't know the kind of contamination or monitoring wells that were there. Closter didn't know what was happening with the site either until we started making inquiries. Now, for the record, the DEP calls the Closter site in compliance even without those test results, Mary Alice. Okay, Brenda, our investigation into Toxic New Jersey has been a collaboration with a dozen content partners, public radio stations and private news organizations, both Rutgers and Montclair State Universities, facilitated by the Center for Investigative Reporting. Joining us are NJ Spotlight, Scott Gorian, and WNYC and New Jersey Public Radio's Sarah Gonzalez. First, Brenda. Why isn't the DEP enforcing these requirements in the first place? Well, by its own admission, the DEP is confronting so many of these sites, Mary Alice, that it has to do triage. As a matter of fact, it told us this when we were there at a press availability, and it says that it prioritizes, essentially focuses on sites that pose a direct health hazard. But I think enforcing the regulations beyond that would require a lot more time and a lot more money, and that's always in short supply down in Trenton. I think that if nobody is directly pushing for answers and for action, then the DEP is struggling to come up with the resources to keep up with it, with all of these sites. Sarah, what were some of the more surprising contaminated sites? So WNYC's data news team uh, did an analysis of, of where New Jersey residents are in relation to all of these sites. And we found that 90%, 89% of New Jerseyans live within a mile of some site that is contaminated, which I think is in itself pretty surprising. Um, 1,400 of those sites, so 1,400 of the 14,000 contaminated sites um, are not in any stage of the process of ever getting it cleaned up. What did you learn about the communities who have contaminated sites that need to be cleaned up? What did you learn about how much information they had? So we, according to the state, the Department of Environmental Protection, initially they told us, oh, these 1,400 or so sites are mostly abandoned properties, right? They told us abandoned gas stations, former dry cleaners, and we went through the list and we knocked on doors and we drove to all of these sites and we found schools and hospitals and police stations and nursing homes and all of these active open businesses that have some kind of contamination um, and no plan in place to ever clean it up. And when I started asking people like Newark schools, which are run by the state of New Jersey or the Newark Police Department, you know, what is the situation with this site? There is some form of contamination there, and there's no plan to clean it up. They didn't even, they weren't even aware of it. The people who should be aware of those sites were not aware of it. So there was really like a communication problem between the state, the state and the cities and even developers and the owners of these sites. You interviewed people who were not aware that they'd been breathing in toxic fumes from a, what kind of factory was it, a lighter fluid factory. Were you surprised to learn how long it took for state involvement? I think what was surprising about that case, so in, in 2013, the DEP became aware that homes were built on the site of a former lighter fluid factory when homes were never supposed to be built there. It was supposed to be like a parking structure or something like that. And so they became aware of it. They tested the, the, the air. They found out that there were these toxic fumes coming into people's homes, and they kind of put a Band-Aid on the problem. What was surprising, though, was that, I mean, and this is 
this is the nature of contamination. Contamination conditions change, it's spread. And so we had moved a block over and now the next to the block next to that. And so residents that I spoke with got letters from the DEP just this past October saying, we have to start testing your air. Finally, what did you learn about race and class and the role that they play in prioritizing cleanup? So again, most of the state is near a contaminated site, but 75% of people who live below the poverty line in New Jersey live within a mile of a site that has no plan to clean it up. And it was 80% of Latinos in New Jersey live near one of these sites with no cleanup plan, and 75% of black residents compared to uh, about 40% of white residents. Scott, let's go to you. You have personal experience with this. You inherited an old abandoned gas station that your grandfather owned, right? Right. I have an interesting perspective on all this reporting we've been doing. Um, I think when the average person thinks of a contaminated site, they picture some former industrial facility that might have dumped chemicals into the river out back years ago. Uh, but as we found out, many of these sites are much smaller former gas stations, former dry cleaners, as I know myself through personal experience. Um, a few years back, I inherited a former gas station that my grandparents had run uh, back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it had been sitting vacant for a number of decades. Meanwhile, there were still gas tanks in the ground. There was an enormous remediation that we had to deal with that we were told could cost over $600,000, which was more money than we had. And who was responsible? That's the question. Well, the estate was of, of my grandparents. Um, and you know, But 600000 was more than the, the estate was worth, Exactly. Right? Um, it, it's a tricky situation, and a lot of site owners are in this situation. It's more than the property's worth, more than they can afford. What do they do about it? Um, and we were lucky in the end. It, you know, it took s several years of dealing with developers, with the town, with the state. Uh, we finally actually had a developer come and, and purchase our property just because it happened to be in a good location where he could redevelop it. Many of these site owners are in much less desirable areas, in blighted areas, in urban areas. They don't have that you know, luxury of that happening. And on top of that, the state fund to clean up a lot of these leaking underground storage tanks has been severely depleted over the last several years. What kind of damage was, was meted out by Sandy along New Jersey's industrial coast? Uh, we looked at that as well. Um, there were, you know, much, most of the focus after Sandy was the residential parts of the coast, the Jersey Shore, but there's the whole industrial part of the coast, particularly in northern Jersey, where you have, you know, sewage treatment plants in New York and New Jersey that leaked 11 billion gallons of raw sewage into the waterways. Uh, you have a lot of oil and gas facilities in the Arthur Kill between New Jersey and Staten Island. Why haven't those areas gotten the kind of attention that other parts of the coast have gotten? I think several reasons. Uh, uh, part of it is just that people don't live there. This isn't a part of the coast that most people see. You really need to get in a boat to, to see it. There's not, you know, scenic walkways and so forth there. These are private industries that run these sites, um, and the state, by and large, has left uh, it up to these private industries to come up with solutions to uh, mitigate their facilities from future storms. Private individuals are responsible for not allowing this kind of seepage into the waterways. Is there a need for a more comprehensive plan under the circumstances? That's, that's been the criticism from um, some environmentalists and, and planning experts that we spoke to. Uh, they feel that, you know, if toxic chemicals seep out of any of these factories, these industrial facilities, they affect, you know, the, the safety, the livelihoods, the health of potentially Everybody. thousands of people, yeah. And so, uh, you know, the state has taken, uh, they, they've made s such a, an effort to protect the, uh, the residential parts of the coast, building dunes, building seawalls and so forth, but there hasn't been that comprehensive approach to the industrial parts of the coast. Do you see it anytime soon? There, it hasn't been proposed yet. It hasn't, uh, you know, it's hard to come up with solutions. These are facilities that are hundreds of acres in, in some cases. There's no simple answers, but, um, environmentalists say the state needs to at least start having the conversation. Okay, thank you all, Brenda and Scott and Sarah, and all of our content partners who collaborated on this investigation. You can access all the reporting on our website, njtvnews.org slash toxicnj. You'll find a collection of the pieces Brenda did this week, Sarah and Scott's work, and also an interactive map where you can look for contaminated sites in your own neighborhood.